I do think that the government's got to take a much bigger part in recognising that the electricity future demands systemic change. Because after all, what has happened is that we used to have a system, which is best summed up by the French word for a generating station, which is centrale. And it's just the right word for this. That's what it was. You had a centrale and it put stuff out. We don't have that increasingly. We have a lot of peak places all the way around putting things in. And uh, if we get it right, then all our electric motor cars will not only take stuff out, but it will, they will also act as uh, temporary, if you like, the holders of electricity. That will happen as well. Hello and welcome to Energy Unplugged by Aurora. This podcast features various experts from Aurora having in-depth conversations with key industry leaders, policymakers and academics from all over the world. It explores the hottest topics across the energy market and gives a unique perspective on major energy issues. Welcome to Energy Unplugged. I'm Dan Monzani, Managing Director for UK and Ireland at Aurora. We are recording this the week after the UK government published its net zero strategy. And the week before, COP26 is hosted in Glasgow, and we could not hope to have a better guest with us to consider both. My guest today has over 50 years experience in public life, consistently uh, as a deep influential voice on climate change and the environment. He was first elected to parliament as a conservative MP under Ted Heath in 1970. He held ministerial office under Margaret Thatcher and John Major in the 1980s and 90s, including cabinet roles as Minister for Agriculture, Food and Fisheries, and then as Environment Secretary. In fact, he was once described by no less than Friends of the Earth as the best Environment Secretary we've ever had. And since 2012, he has been the chair of the UK's Committee on Climate Change. My guest on the show today is Lord Deben. Welcome. Good to see you. Thank you for joining us. I'd like to talk about three broad areas today. So first of all, about how government ministers tackle scientific risk when they're talking to the public. And then perhaps we'll talk a bit more about net zero and the prospects for COP26. So first of all, I was thinking a bit about your experience in ministerial office back in the 90s uh, when you were responsible for handling the BSE crisis. And that was when British cattle were becoming infected with mad cow disease, which in some cases was able to infect humans had consumed infected meat. Uh, and it occurred to me this is quite topical given the efforts that um, politicians today are trying to make to explain risks around COVID and climate. Uh, there's a very famous image of you and your daughter eating a beef burger in order to reassure the public about safety. Um, your approach uh, sought to try and cut through in a simple message as well as the necessary nuance that the risks might contain. Um, What's your reflection on how ministers should strike that balance when trying to explain a complex scientific risk? Well, I think the first thing is that you actually have to live out what it is that you're telling other people to do. Uh, I mean, I didn't right. invite them to ask about my daughter and the, and the hamburger, but somebody offered a hamburger. And what do I do? Do I say I don't want her to have a hamburger, which would be untrue, because I was certainly happy for her to eat the, hum, the hamburger. And as a matter of fact, we were right in doing that, and uh, I know that yeah. uh, people found it difficult, but it did mean that people at least felt that one was honest about it. So I think the first thing is the honesty, which is why, as chairman of the Climate Change Committee, uh, I'm happy that I am fortunate enough to be able to do these things, but I have tried to do the things that I'm asking other people to do. So I do try to drive an electric car and use... Um, he, uh, uh, air source, heat pump, and, and, and the, those sort of things. So I, I think the first thing is that you, you have to be honest about it and do and also show that in your own lives you are actually uh, carrying through what you're asking other people to do. I, I think, secondly, you have to be as transparent as is humanly possible. I mean, right from the beginning, I said I would publish all the information that I got from the scientists so that everybody would know exactly what I upon what I was basing my comments. And I think that's crucially important. Of course, it's a dangerous thing in some senses, because sometimes journalists don't read all the details, and pick up one bit. So you've got to, you, so, so that's got to be taken into account. But in, in general, if you 
give them everything, then frankly, it's quite difficult for them to do anything other than accept that with all that evidence, this is what you have to do. And, and so um, I think that's the second thing, transparency. The third thing is it's very helpful if you're not a scientist. Right. Because you then ask the difficult questions because they've got to explain it to you, which makes it much easier when you're having to explain it to other people. And I happen to be one of a last generation which didn't actually do any science because you used to have to choose between Greek and science. And I didn't have the choice because I was told uh, I was a bright boy, so I did Greek. <laughs> Stupid boys did science, was what we used to say. To them. So that was all very well. But it meant that I never did any science. So it meant that I always had to ask the questions. And of course, you then get some very interesting answers because those simplistic questions are very often the ones that are most difficult to answer. So um, I always remember the terrible case of when they found that the cat had some sort of lesions, which meant that it might possibly have translated from cows this particular disease. And I asked a very simple question, and that was, how many cats do we actually, do, do actually have post-mortems? So how do we know that this is different from other cats? And of course, the answer was, we don't normally do post-mortems on cats. So that, of course, it then made it much easier to be able to say, well, we don't understand this. We don't know about it. It may be serious. It may not be. But we are now sharing with you all the information that we have. And I think that's true on climate change, too. I mean, the fact is, we, if you remember, we were very, very careful about saying that extreme uh, weather conditions were the result of climate change. Until we really had the evidence and the IPCC, it's only in their latest report that they have moved from it appears that this makes a contribution to, to the very direct statement that these, the increase in extreme situations is clearly a result of climate change. I think people respect that and that's what you have to do. Thank you. And it may well be that some of that uh, plain speaking uh, has helped convince people, because um, when we think about climate change, uh, pollsters regularly find that people are saying that the environment is one of their top concerns. A recent Mori poll that I saw recorded more than four fifths of people uh, being concerned about climate change and two thirds actually believing that the UK was already feeling its effects. However, some of that support does appear to disappear when people are told that they'll have to do less of something they enjoy or pay more for it. So do you think that ministers can lead public opinion and make the case for action where this is initially unpopular? Or do ministers simply have to follow the electoral maths? Well, if they follow the electoral maths, they don't get elected, actually, because the point about the electoral maths is that people change their mind. And uh, I think it's very interesting to see that in Germany, when they had those very bad floods, the immediate reaction was, why have ministers not done more about climate change? Now, I bet you those people were exactly the same uh, voters who were saying to Mrs. Merkel, you're doing too much about climate change. We want X, Y and Z now. Um, it's like referenda. I think we'll find quite a lot of people who don't remember they voted to leave the European Union. It's going to be quite interesting to see, because re this is why I, one of the reasons I'm so opposed to referenda, because it seems to me that it is a decision that you make without any responsibility. And that, of course, is true about the polls that you have here. If, 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 if ministers follow what they think is what the public want, uh, when it goes wrong, the public don't remember that they voted in the poll. They say this minister should have done something. So I think the most important thing is, first of all, to decide what is right. Now, when you've decided what is right, you then have to do what is right. The way you present that is perfectly reasonably one in which you try to get other people on board. So, of course, you first of all have to share with them the reason why you think action is necessary. And then you look at the action carefully. Now, we need to eat less meat. 
that, that there's no, you, you can't get out of this. This is what we need to do. Now, we need to do that for health reasons. I mean, I'm only asking something between 20 and 30 percent of reduction. The health people would like us to do much more than that. Now, I'm not in the business of, of, of doing that, so I merely say what is necessary for climate change purposes. Now, the ministers don't like dealing with that, but it is perfectly possible that you start off by saying, well, this seems to be the proper advice. We're not going to be nanny state, but what we are going to say is that we're going to treat that as a necessary part of providing school meals, providing uh, hospital meals, providing meals for the uh, armed forces. In other words, procurement wise, you then begin to go down that route. And then frankly, ministers have got to set examples. I, I really do think, I don't mean going around saying I'm wonderful and I'm eating um, this, um, uh, these lentils. Uh, I mean something quite different. I mean, I mean that if press, ministers can genuinely say, well, I do much more recycling than I used to. I have limited the amount of meat that I'm eating and, and I'm doing those things. I'm not forcing other people to do it. I'm just merely saying that this is what the evidence says, and therefore I am trying to do that. You can create an atmosphere without having to go down to the extreme positions. And I was disappointed when the Prime Minister received um, the report on, on um, food, which uh, Henry Dimbleby produced, when he immediately ruled out uh, doing something about um, the amount of meat that was eaten. Frankly, we're going to have to do that. You have to do it for health reasons. You have to do it for all sorts of other reasons. And it's much better to go out there and say, this is what we think is right. We think that we should be eating more. Uh, we should be eating better meat rather than um, uh, uh, eating less meat, but better meat. That the best... Um, the best carbon footprint in the world is British meat, so we should be choosing British meat. And if we eat less and make better meat, then actually our farmers won't suffer and our health will be that much better. I think you can say that without it being. I've just had to say it earlier on today to the um, uh, Northern Irish um, Agricultural Organisation. Now, it's not easy there because that's what they produce, but you just have to go and say it and say it honestly. And in the end, by the time we went through it with a certain amount of sharpness during it, I think people began to understand that, that, that you can't, you can't avoid telling people the truth. And of course you say it in the most elegant way that you can, but what you can't do is to pretend that it isn't the truth. What, what is the best way to frame those arguments? I, I'm thinking about the politics of net zero here, and it seems to me that we've had a pretty good consensus across political parties in the United Kingdom in, in quite, quite sharp contrast to, to some other countries, the US and Australia spring to mind. Is that a permanent feature that, that gives space to ministers to make the arguments you've just been advancing, or is it something more fragile? What, what are the arguments that resonate more, most deeply with, with British conservatives? No, I think it's a, um, a consensus that uh, has stood the test of time. After all, it stood the test of 11, 12 years. The Climate Change uh, Act was a invention of the Conservative Party in opposition. So it, it started in the right place because it should start on the right because that shows people that this is not some kind of knee-jerk reaction based upon a whole lot of theories. It's actually because we've got to do it because it's got to be done. You know, there is a sort of practicality about this, which is extremely important. Um, and I think that will stand. In fact, I'm sure it will stand, uh, partly because every year it becomes more and more clear that tr climate change is disastrous. And uh, that is hugely important. Um, the, 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 the truth is, though, that... Um, it is being practical about it, it is being sensible about it, and it is not having knee-jerk reactions of both sides, both left and right. I mean, I think the Prime Minister was right when he tried to make the point that what we uh, were doing as a nation was sensible and measured and necessary, but it was not knee-jerk and extreme. So, when I say we can produce the right answer of net zero by 2050, that it will cost less than 1% of the GNP, 
that we have to have a just transition because some people will be will bear a bigger burden than they can bear if you don't have that. When I say that, all that is within reality. So when I talked to the people in the north of Ireland, I said, you can't do net zero by 2050. The rest of the United Kingdom will have to do better in order that you can reach about 84% because of the nature of your economy. I'm not prepared to be pushed by the Greens and the others into saying everybody has to do net zero in the same way, because if I do that, people won't believe that it can be done and therefore they won't try. So you've got to be really practical when you're talking about these things. And I can honestly stand up and say I'm absolutely convinced that we can do all this by 2050, that with a bit of a bit of fair wind behind us, we might do it a bit earlier, but we can't, we can certainly do it then, and it will certainly cost less than 1% of our gross national product each year. So it means that we can do it within any reasonable assessment of our, uh, 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 of the money that we have. Shall we dig, dig into those practicalities then? Um, mm. Because the, because the government uh, published its net zero strategy last week, which in itself was a response to the Committee on Climate Change's own recommendations for the sixth carbon budget. So that's the period covering 2032 to 2037. Does it deliver a coherent plan? Yes, it does. I mean, it, it has some gaps, which we'll come to in a moment. But, but um, as the next step, um, they first of all passed the sixth carbon budget in Parliament. So it becomes a statute. And it can't be changed now without permission of the Climate Change Committee. So that what, that's what gives it real strength. So the world outside knows that that is what we're going to achieve. Uh, then the government has to do the next step, which is to lay the strategy, which is really, um, in this case, largely a repeat of what is in that, but in, if you like, in the government's uh, mechanisms. Now, it's only the next step, but it's an essential step. And in general, it's been a very good step. I mean, we have to say they have carried on in general exactly what we said was necessary. Um, what will happen now is that we will have to make sure that they actually do it. I mean, it's, here you've got the strategy. Now the question is, uh, uh, issue by issue, we'll keep their feet to the fire to make sure that it is done. So it is delivery, which is the next step. But you can't expect that in this one, because that is not what it is. It is the strategy. Now, there are significant gaps. One is this problem they have with talking about changing behaviour. Now, I understand it because we live in a society where there are an awful lot of people who are busy trying to change our behaviour, the cancellation society, so that we're all, I think, very touchy about this because I really do feel that there are many things which I cannot say today, which I could have said uh, 10 years ago. And I am a liberal, moderate person, but there are things that I really cannot discuss now. I think this is a terribly serious issue that we have restricted. So, so there's that background. And there's also the fact that no government likes to be seen as a nanny state. And certainly conservative governments don't. So they feel strongly about that. So I, I think that but we've actually got to face the fact that we do need to encourage people to fly less for example. Now, there are all sorts of ways you can do that. As I say, you don't have to pre preach at people, but you can, for example, make it quite clear uh, in the civil service that people really will normally do meetings internationally by Zoom. There's no reason why they shouldn't, and that they will have to explain why they should want to fly abroad. Now, there are certain occasions when you really have to do it. If we didn't have people all together in Glasgow, you can't have the pressure on people that you really need. But all the summing, many, not all, but many of the previous discussions of details and such like can perfectly well be done like this. And it seems to me that government has to set the example in that way. And it has to insist upon that in its, uh, all the bodies which depend on it. And this is a very important step. And it's also got to say to people, um, business travel is one of those things that really can be reduced very significantly indeed. Travel in order to experience things, which is rudely called holiday travel, is a different thing. And I can quite understand why people don't want to restrict their, their, their holidays. But it's not unreasonable for them to think seriously about 
long journeys, think seriously about whether home uh, holidays, holidays in the rest of Europe, what about the train, a whole series of things of that kind, which just change it enough to mean that we keep within the envelope, very generous envelope that has been given to the, 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 the aeroplane industry. The fact that the government finds all that too difficult even to talk about is, I think, one gap. Second gap, much bigger, much more important, is that we still don't have any real land use policy so that the whole issues of agriculture, of planting trees, of sequestration by, by uh, soil, all those things, really we haven't uh, dealt with. And that is partly because this is a the net zero um, strategy is something produced by, by Bayes and all this other stuff is, is really in the hands of, of DEFRA, it's partly that. It's partly because the government made an immediate decision on our, our stupid decision to leave the European Union, uh, that it would move um, the support for farmers from production support uh, to support for public goods without actually trying to work out how you do it. Um, and uh, the EFRA uh, Select Committee today has produced a report which quite rightly says, if you do this in a haphazard way, it's extremely difficult for farmers to know what to do. Now, I've been pressing this for some long time. It's very simple. It is, and I am a small farmer. I declare an interest in this. I, I, and I've got a son who's very involved in sequestration and, and the rest of it. I, I, I just have to say, if you're really thinking, I have absolutely no idea where, what choices I should be making on the basis of what the government's going to do. So I'm making choices as well as I can, but then I do farm for that reason. I farm because it's an organic farm. I want to show that you can do all these things and, and regenerate the soil. That's why I do it. And I'm fortunate enough to be able to do that. But, but for farmers for whom this is absolutely a matter of living and life and death, they've actually got to do it. I don't know what they're supposed to do at the moment and we still haven't had this and that's why I'm really very insistent that we need to have a, a very clear indication of what they're going to do and how farmers are going to be able to earn because half the farms in Britain are not profitable without the support that they have had after all, right from the beginning of the war, first of all, the wartime support, then deficiency payments, and then the CAP. CAP is only the same thing as the deficiency payments, just a different way of doing it, but it was paying for, for production. So there's no farmer alive today who has ever lived without production support. You can't turn that off and to something totally different with no proper evidence and no proper help to people to prepare for it and not expect to have some pretty grumpy and more than that some pretty endangered farmers so so the strategy as a whole is a big step forward but there's some significant gaps in public engagement aviation agriculture and trade there is a real issue there there's a real issue on trade um, it is not acceptable to uh, do trade deals for free trade arrangements with countries that don't meet your standards. We've just got to recognise that because you can't ask farmers to have high standards of uh, animal welfare, high standards of safety, high standards to meet our needs on climate change. And that's, of course, the one that I'm interested in. You can't do that and then sign up with the Australians who don't have any of those. You just can't do it. And uh, I think farmers are perfectly right to be absolutely furious. And in the places where it's most difficult, like the north of Ireland, this is absolutely devastating. And, and the government hasn't understood that. And uh, we're going to have to fight that. All trade agreements must be in future part of the global desire to fight climate change. And countries like um, New Zealand that have signed up to net zero, and now uh, we understand that so will Australia, we'll just have to understand that part of the deal with that is if you want to have free trade, you've actually got to show that you're doing those things. We may come back to some questions about trade and international negotiations towards the end. Um, if I can, I'd like to ask you a bit about what I think is a very large part of the strategy and indeed about the CCC's advice, which is the electrification of, of most of energy. 
Um, so first of all, perhaps we talk about the power sector and then I'll ask you a bit about heat, uh, both of which are areas that the government said quite a lot on over the last couple of weeks. Um, first of all, the, the government's promised to deliver a net zero carbon electricity system by 2035, yeah. 40, 14 years away, um, which uh, is in line with what the CCC said. Um, but I think you'd agree at the limits of what's deliverable, just in terms of the build rates of wind, nuclear, CCUS, and the investment in system integration. When it comes to delivery, do you think the government can deliver that by pushing harder at the instruments they've got? Or do you think they need radical reform to markets, institutions, planning arrangements to, to deal with this in a different way? Well, I think as so often in life, both actually, they, they can use the instruments they've got, but they need a series of things. First of all, we have to have a new planning act, which actually puts uh, our commitments both internationally through the Paris Agreement and also nationally through the legal requirements now that put those, the, those commitments into the planning system, which they're not at the moment. So that is absolutely necessary. Secondly, I do think that the government's got to take a much bigger part in recognising that um, the electricity uh, future demands systemic change. Because after all, what has happened is that we used to have a system, which is best summed up by the French word for a generating uh, station, which is centrale. And it's just the right word for this. That's what it was. You had a centrale and it put stuff out. We don't have that increasingly. We have a lot of peak places all the way around putting things in. And uh, if we get it right, then all our electric motor cars will not only take stuff out, but it will, they will also act as uh, temporary, if you like, um, holders of electricity. That, that's, that will happen as well. So we've got a different system. And I'm not sure that we have taken that seriously enough. Simply, for example, we haven't understood how you get onshore, offshore wind onshore. We've got a Oh, really, what I called a dad's army system. Each array is supposed to arrange its own connection. That is just absolutely balmy. I mean, you would nowhere else would you have not have a ring main, which is what you really want, an underwater ring main, which means that instead of having dozens of small villages being absolutely furious that somebody's going to build a great station there, you actually take it round until you've got to the right place to bring it in. Um, when they fought for offshore, not onshore, they didn't actually mean that you then put onshore a whole lot of things which you shouldn't do. So it's just that that's one simple example of the fact that we are, haven't got our minds around the, the, the size of this problem and some of the instruments and uh, institutional um, hurdles that have got to be overcome. Yeah, and I, I suppose to be fair to the government, I should mention they, they have con started consulting on options around offshore transmission network. Um, but uh, as you say, it's not there. It's not it's not there yet. I, I want to turn to another bit about electrification. Um, we're quite fond at Aurora talking about how around 8,000 hours a year might well be the easy bit of the challenge, as, as people are often saying. But the last 800 hours in a year is actually really tough. Yeah. In fact, if you go and, if you squeeze out the last bit of carbon from even the power sector, the cost can skyrocket. We've done some calculations that it's perhaps over fifteen hundred pounds a ton. So, I mean, do you do you think do you think we need to push harder beyond the power sector and indeed other sectors and prioritise more investment into negative emissions, either trees or engineered removals, in expectation that we can't quite squeeze that last unit out? Well. Um... I've always believed that when you've got a very difficult problem, you get as near to solving it as you possibly can before you make a decision about not being able to do that last bit. Um, I always remember, too, that there used to be a, a catering company called Lions and used to go to Lions Corner House. Lions Corner House never made any money on their soup because they never managed to explain to people that the last two scoops in the pot that used to come round, because that's how they made it, they would make it centrally, I'm sure it tasted filthy, but they brought it round. It was the last two scoops that actually made the profit. I've, um, and I, all I'm saying is that I don't think you should ignore right from the beginning the last two scoops. So that bit is important, but you don't make that decision now. If you mean that we should be much more concentrating on 
the removal of carbon. I am a great believer in this. I don't mean the mechanical removal because I have not so far seen any really effective concept that, that this can be done on a large enough scale to make it uh, more than an ancillary thing. But the central issue of uh, sequestration, both by soil uh, and by trees, and also very underestimated, very important, by sea and by inshore, the whole concept of, uh, of, of seagrass and kelp sowing to take in the, um, uh, the carbon is really very hopeful. Uh, the, this is vital because it really gets to the heart of the system. We always have emitted things. Human beings are emitters. So are cows and, and tigers and, and plants, they, they, they emit. But there was a balance, the balance of nature, what Rachel Carson really repeated, you know, the great writer of Silent Spring, the balance of nature was that you, uh, she wasn't talking about this, but it is now clear, is that you took out of the uh, uh, atmosphere more carbon than we put into it. It was only when we started to shove vast quantities of carbon into it that the balance was lost. So it is just as important to get that balance back. And one of the ways to do that is to have regenerative farming, to have sequestration by soil. It's a lot of stuff and there's nothing yet in it, the government, but we've really got to get that, uh, the, the seas back. And, and one of the reasons why we have to stop putting plastic in the seas is because again, it, um, it, it, it makes the seas less able to do it. And what on earth are we doing still allowing deep, deep trawling, which tears up the bottom of the sea and actually sends the carbon back up? It is ridiculous that we haven't taken steps in that way. And um, one of the problems is that we might well have got it done on a European basis were we part of the European Union. Now we're not. And now all that the pressures are is for us not to do any of these things because the government has the full force of a fisherman and we really do have to stop being fishermen's ministers and start being fish ministers to make sure that we keep the fish and don't scrabble up the bottoms. And that's a really important thing to do. I, that's a fascinating answer. I was, I was also going to ask you about um, heat briefly, because I, I know this is something you've commented on this week. Um, the government's heat and building strategy uh, made a step forward. Uh, 450 million pounds in grants for heat pumps, which is sufficient for about 90,000 new heat pumps over three years and an ambition to end new gas boilers by 2035. But I think the CCC said you needed five and a half million heat pumps by 2030. Do, is this one of those areas where, you know, perhaps like trawling, we should have gone further faster, or should we be celebrating uh, progress in what has seemed to be quite a politically difficult area that we can build on in the future? Well, we haven't done anything about the trawling, so that that we could at least start doing something about. Uh, on the, on the heat pumps, and the government has taken a view, um, and they may be right. I'm not um, criticising it. Uh, uh, which is to say, what you need here is to take the lesson of the offshore wind. But what you do is to create a market. And the big problem with um, heat pumps is that there is no market for them in reality at the moment. And indeed, the people who make them couldn't sell anything. I mean, it is the worst business for selling these things. I have recently uh, had that experience because I wanted to install one. I just compare the difference with buying a, an electric motor car, which is if you have the money, you can buy an electric motor car very easily because there are a lot of people who want to sell you one. You try buying an air source heat pump and it, finding out what you want and where it goes and how much it costs and all those things. It's absolutely impossible for the chairman of the Climate Change Committee, where I throw all I've got, I know the people I'm supposed to talk to it and, and i just think for mrs miggins this is a total impossibility so if you have a system whereby you are beginning to build a market and then you're getting people starting to deal with this seriously i'm very interested to see the uh, the, the, the octopus and a number of other people are now thinking quite seriously about how they might do this and i suspect that we will have uh, different people selling these into homes. And after all, 
when you think that a very large number of British homes are three bedroom, semi-detached homes, it cannot be impossible to have a standard form of a package which you put in for people in those circumstances. So I think that's what the government has in mind. We'll watch it very carefully. I certainly don't count it down. The experience of offshore wind has been so encouraging that I think we ought to try to make this work. Brilliant. So something, something to build on is, uh, is, uh, is, is definitely um, the tenor of that. I, I just want to ask you a question or two before we move on to talk about COP about who pays for this. Um, CCC's been very clear that over in the round, over the long term, the investment costs of net zero are pretty much offset by the savings. Um, and so it's very affordable in the round. In fact, the prime minister went as far as to say it's easy to be green uh, at a recent speech to the UN doesn't seem to me the Chancellor thinks it's quite that easy. And perhaps part of the challenge is that the costs fill, fall early, but the benefits come later. I mean, and the Treasury's view in their net zero review um, document last week was that seeking, the, seeking to pass those costs onto future taxpayers through borrowing would not be consistent with intergenerational fairness or fiscal sustainability. And I wonder whether you agree with that. Well, I think, first of all, one has to recognise that uh, different people are looking at this from a different kind of role. I mean, the Treasury has what we always know the Treasury has is the role of the financial director. And you find that in your own business. You've got a frightfully good idea. You know you want to do it. It seems to be absolutely right. The future of the company depends on it. And your financial director then says, well, I don't know about that. What about this and that and the other? And that's what his job is. So I, I don't find that too terrifying. I think that's part of the, the whole thing of keeping the, the <laughs> keeping the car on the road. So that's uh, the, the the second thing is the Treasury always has a fear. It, it, it recognises cost because it feels I pay that money out. Um, advantages, offsets, they never really think as real. They, it's, it's a psychology. You just have to accept that. It, it always has been true. So, um, And part of it's from, from bitter experience, as indeed your financial director, no doubt, will have said that when you're talking about those issues. So um, where does that leave us at this moment? I mean, I think, first of all, uh, we have to recognise that the vast quantity of this is going to be paid for by the private sector. And what the government has to do, therefore, is to create circumstances in which the private sector has confidence to invest. And that, that is a perfectly proper way of government doing it. And it isn't an, it isn't an over expensive way. And indeed, the one has to say that the Treasury, whatever it may say, has actually provided the money for that being possible. So that's the first bit. Then there's the question of uh, what you do about the people who are asked to do things which they can't afford. And there very often, first of all, there's the section of people who are going to benefit from it, but have to up front cost. So if you do have a better system of heating and you do put in all sorts of energy saving things, that costs money. And over 10 years, you will get it back. But many people don't have the money in the first place. So the government's got to think of ways in which they can do that. And the private sector has also got to think of ways in which that can, in fact, be uh, uh, turned into a system of loans which, which work. And they've also got to do it in a way that is simple. Because the other problem is that governments do invent most complicated things and nobody actually therefore does it. That's what happened to the Green Deal. If you want to know what's wrong with the Green Deal, it was nobody understood it. And most people have got much better things to do their time than trying to understand a government Green Deal. So you've got to have a very simple system and you've got to tell the public finance uh, watchdogs, yeah, you know, there's going to be some things that will not work. And what's more, there'll be a bit of fraud that will happen. We know that. I just want to say to people as a businessman all my life, except when I was a minister and a businessman now, if I get 60% of the um, uh, question answers right, I'm not doing too badly. If I do 70%, we're probably making quite a profit. If I do 80%, I'm brilliant. And if I do 90%, I'm a liar. I mean, it just is, we've got to understand that governments have really got to stop believing they can be perfect. 
and they have therefore to do the best they can. For goodness sake, don't change it all the time, which then absolutely makes it difficult. Because you've got a better idea or think you can make it easier, actually, it's much better not to. It's much better to do it less well, but in a way which people have grown used to and can handle. And if you do all those things together, then I think we can get over the problems of, uh, of, um, uh, of a just transition. But the biggest thing of all is that we're going to have to do these things anyway. You don't get out of COVID without doing these things. You don't get uh, you, you, you don't begin to build a new economy unless you do these things. And the thing I want people all the time to say is that we fight climate change because it is essential for our existence. But in fighting it, we produce a greener, cleaner, kinder world. So it's a terribly exciting moment. And the government sometimes seems to me to, to miss that opportunity. That's a very, very fair critique. And actually, as we're speaking, the Chancellor's on his feet announcing quite a lot of capital spend and net zero. So we shouldn't be too, uh, too dismissive of, uh, of the investment going, going in there. Um, I think we should turn to, to COP now and to international negotiations. Um, your own experience with these goes back, I think, to uh, to the Rio Earth Summit in the in, in John Major's uh, government. My, my predecessor did Rio, and I came in immediately afterwards. Ah, right, not not quite then, but um, uh, you were certainly in government at the time. Uh, and the what, what in your view are the key ingredients to a successful climate diplomacy? Well, you need real leadership, and I think the government has done that. I have to say. You need to be um, very, very delicate about people's, um, about the, the, the selling that people have to do back at home. And so very often you need to um, talk very carefully about certain things, which may not be uh, things that matter to you, but matter very considerably to them, and that they will deliver if you're prepared to use certain language which they need to do. So I'm a great believer in being able to do that. I think thirdly, um, you do have to keep people's feet to the fire. You do have to remind people of what will happen if you don't do whatever it is that you're trying to do. And in this case, it, it is a matter of the existence of the world. You, you can't avoid the reality. You mustn't depress people to such a degree that they think it's not worth trying. But on the other hand, it is no good. I mean, I had a earlier um, uh, Zoom in which somebody was saying, you know, I'm a farmer and I can't manage this and I don't. And I, in the end, I had to say to him, but and therefore politicians shouldn't do anything. And, and I had to say to him, look, if, if politicians don't do those things, you won't have a farm. Let's be clear about it. This is where you're, I know how old you are, so I can tell you that. If you live to my age, you won't have a farm. So don't try to pretend that you can actually operate uh, in a world in which you can ignore the truth. And, and that's why you have to come together. That's why these conferences are so important. Um, and I do think the government has, in general, prepared for it well, in terms of its, uh, 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 in terms of both of its first steps of setting these targets, and now of the net zero strategy and such like. I think they've done that well. I think they were wrong, very wrong, and immoral to cut overseas development um, uh, aid this uh, time, because I think that the getting the um, poorer countries on board. We've got to accept that we have to pay for that. We've grown rich through pollution and they haven't, and they will need to have the transition and we'll have to pay for it. And uh, they find it very difficult to believe we will pay for it. And actually cutting from 0.7 to 0.5 was a great mistake psychologically. Now I understand we're going to put it back in, so the budget, so the budget says, in, in two years' time. Well, that's all very well, but it does mean that a lot of women haven't been educated. It means that a lot of people whom we ought to be helping because it's good for us. I never understand why people don't understand that if you if you help these countries to make this move, then that is going to help our climate. It's really it's you, you can do it on the basis of absolute selfishness. But I also think it sets a very bad example if you kick people in the teeth 
because you're in a difficult position when they're in a worse position. I, I don't have to refer to any of the gospel stories, but it is absolutely clearly an immoral act and should not have happened. But apart from that, I think they have done really very well, except for that and the trade arrangements. And again, the trade arrangements, they were so desperate to show that they could make trade deals after Brexit that uh, I think this distorted the way in which they looked at it. And I think that'll have to be looked at again. What do you think success looks like and how optimistic are you about that? Well, I think, first of all, we've got to recognise we've had a lot of success already. I mean, you know, who would have thought that Japan and South Korea would have uh, signed up to uh, net zero by 2050? Who'd have thought that the Chinese would have agreed not to uh, fund uh, overseas uh, developments of coal-fired power stations and the like? Who'd have thought that um, America would be back in the world and would be really trying to do some very serious things. All those things have happened, but they've happened before the COP, but they wouldn't have happened without the COP. And so therefore one has to recognize that as part of it. I think there's a lot more that will need to be done. Um, if you ask how optimistic I am, I'm by nature an optimist. Um, I do think that the reality of climate change has come to more people more widely than has ever been before. And I would hope that that will result in substantial advance, which means ratcheting up where we were at, um, uh, uh, at Paris. And it also means a real commitment to those countries that we need to help to get to that stage. And that is really tough, um, but I think we can do it. Um, and I think that the patient negotiations that have gone on up to now give us some, some real hope. And clearly the Prime Minister, in his own particular way, is determined to uh, make sure that it succeeds. And he has been honest about how hard it is. So well, I think we start off all right. Brilliant. I, I, always good to have a note of optimism going into these things. Um, I want to turn to a, a regular feature we have on our, our podcast, uh, which we call Over or Under. Uh, and we, what I'm going to do is I'm going to suggest a handful of uh, concepts uh, which uh, you should say whether you think they are under or overrated in the consensus, and perhaps say a sentence or two to explain it. It's a sort of um, Bruce Forsyth's play your cards right for energy nerds, if you like. <laughs> <laughs> And I thought, we'd, uh, I thought we'd focus it on international climate negotiations, since that's what we're talking about. Uh, so I'll, give you a, I'll, give, I'll just throw a couple at you and see whether you think they're under or overrated. So first of all, uh, announcing long term net zero targets. Oh, I think they're underrated. But yes, I think they're really important. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, funding for developing countries. And I, I say that rather than simply doubling down on abating emissions in the developed world? Oh, I think that is, again, that's that's underrated because that is absolutely crucial and you get more bangs for your buck there than you do anywhere else. But you can't do it unless you're doing the other. I mean, I had a great argument with a former chancellor who said, well, what we should do is do nothing in Britain at all and spend all this money in the developing world because you get more bangs. Your but you can't because nobody would believe you. I mean, it just wouldn't work. You just have to do both. OK. Um, investing in innovation. Well, I rather want to say both under and over. It's it's it, it's overestimated. If, 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 if there's a sort of belief that somehow or other, if only the government put vast sums of money into things, we'd get things out at the other end. It, that isn't true, and it's also not only innovation. It is actually um, commercialisation. We're actually rather good in Britain at inventing things, so to speak, and we're terrible at turning that into into the marketplace. And I think. There's a lot more to be done in our systemic problems, which mean that people invent things here and sell it to the Americans. And we've really got to do something to change that. Excellent. Now, here's one I think I know the answer to, given what you said earlier. Carbon border adjustments to make sure trade is done on a climate inclusive basis. Well, I think that's underestimated. Um, I, I don't like the, the words carbon border adjustments. It seems to me that it's a whole range of things. 
And <clears throat> one of the things that we should be doing is in the private sector. I mean, I think people should say to, um, for example, uh, uh, um, food companies, uh, frankly, we're not investing in you unless you only buy from um, people who are meeting these carbon demands. Now, we could, we could deal with the Australian-New Zealand agreements if uh, it's already true that almost every supermarket only sells British uh, beef and British lamb. But uh, we could deal with it entirely if we got the major food service organisations, people like Bid Food and, uh, and, and, and Breaks, to make them commit themselves only to buy from people who meet the um, the, the requirements of climate change. It wouldn't take much doing because investors do think that's right. So you can do quite a bit of border adjust adjustment, not at the border, but internally, because people don't buy the stuff. Very good. Well, thank you very much uh, for that. I think that's a sort of natural place to leave it. And I think my takeaway from uh, quite a lot of your responses on that last section is actually people are possibly underestimating the importance of all of these things. And uh, it takes it takes quite a lot to get us to net zero. Uh, but look, thank you, Lord Dean. That's been a fascinating discussion. Thank you for your candor. Uh, we'll all be looking forward to COP26 and hoping to share in your optimism uh, as we get to the other end. So thank you very much for joining us on the podcast today. Thank you. I've enjoyed it, Dan. Thank you. That was Dan Monzani, Managing Director for UK and Ireland at Aurora, speaking to Lord Deben, Chairman of the Climate Change Committee. Do keep an eye on our podcast feed for more in-depth conversations with senior members of the energy industry. The best way to do this is to subscribe on whatever platform you use. Thanks for listening and goodbye.